Christian is on a journey to a place called heaven, a one-way trip that will last for eternity. Yet very few Christians understand what the Bible says about their eternal home. Dr. Robert Jeffers has written a best-selling book called A Place Called Heaven, and it was specifically written to answer the 10 most frequently asked questions about heaven with the truth of God's Word. Request your copy with a generous gift to support the ministry of Pathway to Victory. Perhaps you've wondered about questions like, what will we do in heaven? Do people in heaven know what is happening on earth? Or will we know one another in heaven? This book will answer your most pressing questions about your eternal home. And when you're finished reading, you can pass the book along to a friend who's seeking answers about God and heaven as well. Discover the delights of your eternal home. Request your copy of A Place Called Heaven from Pathway to Victory. Write to P.O. Box 223-609, Dallas, Texas, 75222. As we wrap up our series on heaven, we're talking about how to prepare for our journey to heaven. And we've talked about six practical steps that we can take to make sure we're ready when the time comes for us to go to that place called heaven. Now, last time we looked at the first three of those steps. Remember what they were? If not, they're on your outline. Now today, let's look at the fourth way to prepare for heaven, and that is make the most of your time on earth. Make the most of your time on earth. God has allotted a different number of years and days for every one of us in this life. And yet we talk about people's average lifespan. You know, before the flood, people lived much longer. Remember before the flood, people lived hundreds and hundreds of years. Pop quiz. Who was the oldest man who ever lived? Methuselah, he died at 969 years of age. And yet immediately after the flood, people's lifespan decreased dramatically. And then through science and technology and better nutrition, people's lifespan started to increase. But did you see just this week, for the first time in decades, people's lifespan has decreased once again. Nevertheless, in Psalm 90, Moses said there's an average lifespan for most people. Now Moses beat it. He lived to be 120 years of age. And yet in Psalm 90, verses 10 and 12, he said, 70 years are given us, and some may even live to 80. But even the best of these years are often empty and filled with pain. Soon they disappear, and we are gone. Verse 12 Teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. I'll never forget the first time I ever heard anybody speak about those verses. I was sitting in a freshman orientation chapel at Baylor University. I mean, at that time in my life, time moved like molasses. Age sure changes things. <laughs> Does anybody here today talk about <laughs> how slowly time moves? Do any of you talk about that? Don't we talk about how quickly it goes? The older and older you get, the more quickly it seems to go. It's like one wag said, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the more quickly it goes. You've discovered that, haven't you? <laughs> And that's what Moses was saying, just a little more eloquently. He said, teach us to number our days to realize how very few they are. Paul said it this way in Ephesians 5, 15, and 16. He said, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. In the Bible, uh, the word walk was an analogy for how you live your life. He said, be very careful how you live your life in light of how short time is. Here's a good exercise. I hope every one of you have a list in your mind of at least three things you'd like to accomplish before you die. That's a good thing to sit down and think about. What three things do I think God would have me to do before I die? And once you get those three things in your mind, ask yourself as you go through the day, how much time do you actually devote to doing those major priorities in your life? 
Now, much, most of us spend very little time doing those things that we think are the most important. And that's why Paul said, make the most of your time. The Greek word, make the most, is a word literally that means buy up. Buy up your time. Time is a precious commodity. Did you know life is a lot like a dollar bill? Life is like a dollar bill. You can spend it any way you want, but you can only spend it once. And that's why Paul said, you better buy it up. You better make the most of it. The philosopher Henry David Thoreau was very fearful that he would come to the end of his life and not realize that he had really lived life. He wrote, I did not wish to live what was not life. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life. Of course, his way of doing it was going and living in the woods. Paul had a better idea for how to make the most of your time. Make the most of your time by living it in, accord in accordance with God's plan for your life. He said, make the most of your time because the days are evil. What does he mean by that? He simply meant Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. And part of your, his scheme for your life is not just to lead you into doing sin, sinful things, but into doing meaningless things. To fritter away your time, not doing the things that will really count. I like the way J.B. Phillips paraphrases Ephesians 5, 15 to 17. Listen to this. Live life then with a due sense of responsibility. Not as men who do not know the meaning of life, but as those who do. Make the best use of your time despite all the evils of these days. Don't be vague, but grasp firmly what you know to be the will of God. Isn't that great? Make the most of your time. Number five, to prepare for your journey to heaven, minimize your pre-departure regrets. Have you ever had this experience? You're at the departure gate getting ready to get on a plane and you remember something you should have done. Gee, I should have stopped the newspaper. I should have stopped the mail. Now those kind of regrets are minimal. They have no lasting consequences. But to come to the end of your life ready to enter into heaven with regrets, that's a whole different story. As a pastor, I've had the experience many times of sitting with Christians who were about to die and listening to them to lament their regrets in life. Relationships they wish they had maximized. Relationships they wish they hadn't broken. Opportunities they should have taken advantage of. I'm reminded of the words of the poet John Greenleaf Whittier who wrote, For all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. Ronnie Ware was a worker in a care center, and in her work she had the experience of listening to many deathbed confessions. And out of that experience she wrote a book entitled, The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. You know what they are? Number one, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Number three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my family. Number five, I wish I'd let myself be happier. You know, regrets are like a cancer. They eat at the very soul of our being. And there's certainly no way to spend your final days here on earth. When I think about that, I think about my own dad. Um, my father was uh, successful in his career. He was a great Christian. He led my mom to faith in Christ and led us to become Christians. He had an upper middle class income, took trips, and yet when he was 66 years of age, he was told he had pancreatic cancer and had four months to live. And you know, I'll never forget those four months sitting and talking with my dad often and those weren't altogether happy days for my dad. I listened to him talk about all of his regrets in life. And as I listened to my dad talk, I realized the power that regrets have to extinguish the joy of an otherwise happy life. How can you make sure that you don't end your life 
with a long list of regrets. You know, one of the best resolves you can make is right now to focus on those things you believe God would have you to do, regardless of how long he has left for you here on earth. On your outline, I've encouraged you to engage in an exercise that I think really would honor God. That is, think through five major areas of your life, your relationship with God, your relationship to your family, your relationship with friends, your career, your finances. And then draw a column like this and ask God to help you identify what three things would you like to accomplish in each of these areas of your life before you go to heaven. Take an hour sometime this week and take time to fill out what are the three things God would like me to concentrate on the remaining years that I have. That's what Paul had in mind in Ephesians 5 when he said, live your life with a sense of purpose. Don't be vague. Oh, I want to be a better person. I want to be happier. Don't be vague, but firmly grasp what you know to be the will of God for your life. You know, one way to minimize your regrets in life is to focus right now on what God would have you spend the rest of your life doing. But part of dealing with regrets is going back to past mistakes and dealing with those as well. You know, mistakes can't be erased from our life, can they? But you can allow whatever mistakes you've made in the past to be a stepping stone to make significant changes right now in your life that will affect your tomorrow and your eternity. That's the way to deal with past mistakes so that you don't have any regrets. You can't erase them, but use those mistakes as a stepping stone to allow you to change your tomorrow and your forever. You know, when Paul came to the end of his life, he didn't come to the end of his life without any mistakes, but he came to the end of his life without any regrets. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, as he prepared for his execution, he said to Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course, and I have kept the faith. Finally, to prepare for your journey to heaven, take care of the practical matters before you depart. Take care of practical matters before you depart. One last item to check off on your to-do list before you depart this world is to make sure that those you care about most are adequately provided for. You know, Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah with a sobering message. He said in 2 Kings 20 verse 1, Set your house in order, Hezekiah, for you shall die and not live. That's pretty good advice for all of us. Set your house in order, for you are going to die. Tony Campolo says it well. He said, one day you're going to die. They're going to take you to the cemetery, drop you in a ditch, throw dirt in your face, and then go back to the church and eat potato salad. <laughs> it's true. Audrey Hendel wrote about her husband, Jim, who was a CPA and a certified financial planner. A few years before he died, her husband, Jim, wrote an article on how to leave your financial house in order for your family. 1 Timothy 5.8 was the basis for his article. Paul said, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. You know, Men especially, providing for your household means more than earning a living and making sure they have their needs while you're alive. It means making sure they're cared for after, they, after you're dead so that they know exactly what to do. By the way, do you know the most foundational thing you can do to set your house in order for your departure? Make sure you have a will. Did you know 64% of Americans have no will? 64%. Guess what? If you die without a will, you don't get to say what happens to your money. You know who determines what happens to your money? It's not your family either. The government tells you what's going to happen to your money when you die, either by state regulation and law or by the federal income tax code. And by the way, make sure that will reflects your values. Make out a will. And when you make that will out, don't forget the church. 
It's your last way of making sure some of what you've accumulated goes on and on and on and on for eternity. Set your house in order. You know, when I think of somebody who prepared for his journey to heaven without any regrets, I think about Abraham. You know, in Genesis 25, 8, we have this word about Abraham's death. Moses writes, and Abraham breathed at his last and died at a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied with life. And he was gathered to his people. Amy, I want you to think about that as an epitaph for my headstone, because that's really a great one, isn't it? Died at a ripe old age, satisfied with life. Abraham was satisfied. He was content. He had no regrets about his past. <laughs> Not that he didn't make any mistakes. He made some humongous mistakes, but he knew they had been forgiven by God. He died satisfied without regrets when it came to his children. He had successfully passed on his faith to his children and to his grandchildren. And he died satisfied about his future. He knew he was headed to be gathered with his people and with his God because of his faith in God's provision for his sin. He died satisfied with life. Are you ready for your journey to that place called heaven? Some of you may say, well, pastor, <laughs> honestly, I get fearful when I think about not the end result, but the process of getting there to that place called heaven. I'm fearful of death. Whenever I think of the fear of death, I think of the true story of John Todd. John Todd uh, was born in 1800 in Vermont. He spent the first six years of his life living in a little hamlet called Killingsworth. When he was six years old, John Todd's parents, both of them, died suddenly. He and his siblings had to be parceled out among any relative that would take them. He had a very kind-hearted aunt who agreed to take him and to raise him. So he went to live with her. For the next 15 years, she cared for him just like a mom. When he was 21 years of age, he left home, went to school, prepared for the ministry, became a successful pastor. In his middle age years, he received word that his aunt who had cared for him was about to die. She wrote him a letter and said that even though she was a Christian, she greatly feared death. Moved with compassion, John wrote her back, recounting that night when he, a frightened little boy, was welcomed into the loving and warm home of his aunt. And this is what he wrote to his aunt. It is now 35 years since I, a little boy of six, was left quite alone in the world. You sent me word you would give me a home and be a kind mother to me. I have never forgotten the day when I made that long journey of 10 miles to your home. I can still recall my disappointment when instead of coming for me yourself, you sent your servant Caesar to fetch me. I well remember my tears and my anxiety. As perched high on the horse and clinging tight to Caesar, I rode off to my new home. Night fell before we finished the journey, and as it grew dark, I became lonely and afraid. Do you think she'll go to bed before I get there? I asked Caesar anxiously. Oh, no, he said reassuringly. She'll sure stay up for you. When we get out of these here woods, you'll see her candles shining in the window. Presently, we did ride out in the clearing, and there, sure enough, was your candle. I remember you were waiting at the door, that you put your arms close about me, and that you lifted me, a tired and bewildered little boy, down from that horse. You had a big fire burning on the hearth, a hot supper waiting for me on the stove. After supper, you took me to my new room. You heard me say my prayers, and then you sat beside me until I fell asleep. You probably realize why I'm recalling all of this to your memory. Someday soon, God will send for you to take you to a new home. Don't fear the summons, the strange journey, or the dark messenger of death. God can be trusted to do as much for you 
as you were kind enough to do for me so many years ago. At the end of the road, you will find love and a welcome waiting, and you will be safe in God's care. That's the future God has planned for you. I go, Jesus said, to prepare a place for you. It's a place more magnificent than you could possibly imagine. It's a place where every heartache will be erased and every dream will be fulfilled. It's a place reserved for those who have trusted in Christ as their Savior. It's a place called heaven. What a wonderful day it will be when we finally see this glorious place God is preparing for us. To assure you that God's promise of heaven is the only way, I've prepared a resource just for you called What Seven World Religions Teach About Heaven. You will find clear, side-by-side -side comparisons of what Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, and three other world religions believe about what heaven is and how they say to get there. This resource is my gift to you simply for contacting Pathway to Victory today. Now, don't go away. I'll be back with more in just a moment. The Bible says that our lives are like a vapor, a tiny puff of smoke, Yet very few people give their eternal destiny much thought. Discover what awaits you in your eternal home with A Place Called Heaven, 10 Surprising Truths About Your Eternal Home by Dr. Robert Jeffress. Request your copy when you give a generous gift to Pathway to Victory. And when your gift is $75 or more, you'll also receive the A Place Called Heaven Lifeway Teaching Set. This brand new resource is perfect for individual, family, or small group study. It contains six video sessions, digital downloads, a Bible study book, and extra leader resources. Your gift today will be directly channeled into reaching men and women around the world with the good news about heaven and the Lord's gift of eternal life. When we tell people the truth about heaven, our message is interlaced with the truth of the gospel. So thank you for helping us to lead others to Jesus Christ by giving generously to Pathway to Victory. Unless you're a part of the rapture, one day all of us will face death. You can't avoid it, but you can be ready for it. Today, I hope you will start taking the necessary steps to ensure that you are fully prepared when God calls you home. Whether you need to minimize your regrets, maximize your time, or take care of practical matters for those you leave behind. And if you think you're too old or you're too ordinary for God to use right now, well, make plans to join us next week. Next week on a special edition of Pathway to Victory, my daughter Julia and I are going to preview my brand new series, Choosing the Extraordinary Life, God's Seven Principles for Success and Significance. Stay with us for a preview of next week's special. Today, when you give a generous gift to support the ministry of Pathway to Victory, we'll say thanks by sending you a copy of Dr. Jeffress's best-selling book, A Place Called Heaven. When your gift is $75 or more, you'll also receive the complete A Place Called Heaven Lifeway teaching set, plus what seven world religions teach about heaven as our gift to you, simply for contacting us today at Pathway to Victory. And remember, you can receive three free issues of Pathway Magazine by contacting us at ptv.org. These programs are only made possible because of your generous support. So thanks for calling, writing, or going online to give today. Now, coming up next... Hi, I'm Robert Jefferson. Welcome again to Pathway to Victory. One day, followers of Christ will close their eyes for the last time here on earth and open them again in the presence of Jesus Christ. So what steps should we be taking now in order to be ready for that all-important day of our departure? How can we learn to look forward to heaven with joyful anticipation instead of fear and dread? Today, we're answering the question, how can I prepare for my journey to heaven on today's edition 
of Pathway to Victory. Every Christian is on a journey to a place called heaven, a one-way trip that will last for eternity. Yet very few Christians understand what the Bible says about their eternal home. Dr. Robert Jeffress has written a best-selling book called A Place Called Heaven, and it was specifically written to answer the 10 most frequently asked questions about heaven with the truth of God's Word. Request your copy with a generous gift to support the ministry of Pathway to Victory. Perhaps you've wondered about questions like, what will we do in heaven? Do people in heaven know what is happening on earth? Or will we know one another in heaven? This book will answer your most pressing questions about your eternal home. And when you're finished reading, you can pass the book along to a friend who's seeking answers about God and heaven as well. Discover the delights of your eternal home. Request your copy of A Place Called Heaven from Pathway to Victory. Write to P.O. Box 223-609, Dallas, Texas, 75222. When I began this series on heaven, I used an upcoming trip we had planned to a foreign country as an analogy of the trip we're all going to take to a foreign land one day to that place called heaven. Well, since that time, we actually took that trip. We went to London for a few days, and the trip was uneventful, except for one mistake I made. I forgot to pack any extra socks with me. By the fourth day of the trip, I broke down and went to the local department store and purchased some cheap socks. I actually knew it was time to do so when the original pair I brought with me were no longer lying by the bed every night. They were standing by the bed every night waiting to greet me when I awakened. Now, that was a mistake, but it had no lasting consequences. It was a little uncomfortable for my family members who were standing downwind from me the first three days of the trip, but no permanent harm. However, failing to adequately prepare for the real trip we're all taking, for that trip to the place called heaven, not preparing adequately can have devastating and unending consequences. We've got to be prepared for the trip. And that's why I thought the last subject we ought to talk about as we contemplate heaven is, how can I prepare for my journey to heaven? And that's what we're going to talk about this week and next time. We're going to look at six practical steps every one of us should take as we prepare for our journey to that place called heaven. The first step is the most foundational, and that is make sure you have a valid passport. You know, to travel to most countries, you have to have a passport. No passport, no entry into that country. I discovered the hard way <laughs> the importance of having a passport a number of years ago. When I was youth minister here many years ago, uh, our youth choir, our chapel choir, took a trip to the Soviet Union. Some of you were on that trip with us. It was during the height of the Cold War. Tensions between the Soviet Union and the U.S. were very, very cold. And uh, I remember that experience of being in the Soviet Union for a little over a week and how oppressive the atmosphere was. And frankly, we couldn't wait to get out of there. And finally, the day arrived for our departure. We were scheduled to leave Moscow at midnight one night to fly to Rome, and everybody was excited about getting out of there. We were at the Moscow airport, so everybody went through passport control, all the sponsors, all the kids. I was the last one to go through. After all, I felt like I ought to be sure all the kids made it on first. And so it was my turn to go through. Amy was already on the other side waiting for me, and I reached in my pocket to pull out my passport, and it wasn't there. Now, I checked in my other pocket. It wasn't there. I checked my pants. It wasn't there. And they started calling the flight, getting ready to leave for Rome. And so I went up to the Soviet guard and explained the predicament that I was a leader and that that was my group over there. Trust me, he could not have cared less. 
no passport, I wasn't leaving. Amy and I had been married exactly one year. She was standing on the other side, seeing what was going on. She began to cry as she thought about her new husband being in a Russian gulag for the next 20 years. And finally, after frantically searching, one of the sponsors on the trip started to grin. He reached in his pocket and pulled out my passport he had taken as a joke. <laughs> Trust me when I tell you, after 35 years, Amy still doesn't think it's funny. <laughs> but you know, the panic I felt that night Although it was very real, it pales in comparison to the panic some people are going to feel when they stand at the entrance of heaven, thinking God is going to welcome them into heaven, and then they hear those words Jesus said in Matthew 7, 22. He said, for many will say to me on that day, that is the judgment day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. And then he will answer to them, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, I never knew you. Why are these people going to be turned away from heaven? They don't have the right spiritual passport. No passport, no entry into heaven. What is the spiritual passport we need to get into heaven? It's not a heart that is stamped Catholic. If your heart is stamped Catholic, you're not going to make it into heaven. It's not a heart that's stamped Church of Christ. If your heart is stamped Church of Christ, you're not getting into heaven. If your heart is stamped Baptist, you're not going to be welcomed into heaven. It's only a heart that is stamped forgiven that is welcomed into heaven. That's all that matters, being forgiven of our sins. No other stamp makes a difference in the presence of God. The Bible has a word for forgiven. It's the New Testament word justified. Justified is a legal term that refers to what God does for us when we trust in Christ as Savior. He justifies us. He declares us not guilty based on what Christ did for us on the cross. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way God will allow you and me into heaven is by being forgiven of our sins. And contrary to many opinions, there are not many ways to heaven. There is only one way to heaven, and that is through faith in Christ. I realize that's unpopular to say today. Many people do think there are other routes to heaven. How can you make sure that when you stand at the entrance of heaven, God is going to look at your heart and welcome you into his presence? 1 John was written in order that people might know for sure their eternal destination. In 1 John 5, the apostle writes, verse 11, God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God in order that you may know you have eternal life. Who is it that knows they have eternal life? Those who believe in the name of the son of God. That word believe doesn't mean an intellectual assent to a certain set of facts about Jesus. You can believe all the things about Jesus correctly, that he was the son of God, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world, that he rose again on the third day. You can believe all those things and go straight to hell when you die. The Bible says even the demons believe those things. No, to believe means to trust in, to cling to, to put your whole weight upon to trust in Jesus means to come to that place in your life when you realize you cannot save yourself. That it is only through what Christ did for you and dying on the cross and receiving the punishment that God intended for each of us. Only by clinging to, trusting in, putting your whole weight upon Jesus Christ is your heart stamped forgiven and you are welcomed into the presence of God. And notice what John said. He said, I've written these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. God doesn't want us to face death uncertain about our future. 
He wants us to know with absolute certainty that we're going to be welcomed. You don't want any surprises on the other side of the grave. To face eternity without knowing with absolute certainty where you are headed is a risk no sane person would take. And that's why it's important that you know now that you have the spiritual passport you need to be welcomed into heaven. If you wait to try to get your papers in order after you die, you've waited too long. That's the first step to prepare for our trip to heaven. But it's the foundational step. There are others we need to take as well. And that leads to step number two. Live with a destination mindset. Live with a destination mindset. The fact is, we don't know when our departure to that place called heaven is, do we? We don't know when it's going to be. And so that means we face an unusual responsibility of preparing for our trip to the next world while still living in this world. God calls us to be residents of two worlds, the next world and this world. Now make no mistake about it, our true citizenship is in heaven. Philippians 3.20 says, For we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting for him to return as our Savior. Our real citizenship is in that new country we're headed toward. Nevertheless, God has left us here as well. And he's given us certain real responsibilities. We have responsibilities with the family that God's entrusted to us. We have responsibilities at work. And of course, our greatest responsibility, 2 Corinthians 5.20, is to be ambassadors, to be representatives for Christ, to be God's mouthpieces, urging people to be reconciled to God through faith in Jesus. So we actually have two responsibilities, preparing for the next world while living in this world. We are to be thinking about there and preparing for there, but we still have work to do here. The Bible talks about that here, there mentality. Again, the Bible emphasizes over and over again that there is our final destination. In Hebrews 11, verse 13, uh, the writer says, we are nothing but strangers and exiles on the earth. In Colossians 3, 2, Paul says, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. But here's the ironic thing. The more we focus on there, the more effective we become here. It means to live every day as if it were your last day before God calls you home. Because one day it will be that day. How do you prepare for your journey to heaven? Number three, refuse to allow your departure to paralyze you with fear. Winston Churchill, who certainly was agnostic, if not an atheist, said at one point, any man who says he's not afraid of death is a liar. Well, that's certainly true for non-Christians, but it's even true of some Christians. Uh, One reason they fear heaven, that journey to heaven, is they don't know much about it. That's one reason I've preached these weeks on heaven, to give you just an idea of what God has planned for you. Some Christians fear their departure to heaven. But let me share with you today two reasons a Christian never needs to fear his departure to heaven. First of all, death is never premature. If you're a Christian today, you can write it down, bank on it. You will not depart this world one second before God's departure time for you. No Christian leaves this world one second before God's appointed time. In Acts 2.23, Peter at the great sermon at Pentecost said, this man Jesus was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. God had a plan for Jesus' life. It's a plan that included the date of his birth in Bethlehem, and it included the day of his death on Calvary. And that same God has a plan for your life. God has an immutable, unchangeable plan for your life. He has written down the day of your birth. He's written down the day of your death. If you don't believe that, just consider Ephesians 1 verse 11. 
Paul said, also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. Every part of your life has been planned by God. There are no accidents in your life or the life of somebody you love. Everything, all things, including the day of your death, are following the counsel of his will. And notice that word will is singular. God doesn't have multiple wills. He doesn't have multiple plans for your life. He doesn't have plan A. I hope this is what happens, God says. But if that doesn't work out, then I've got plan B and plan C. No, he has one secret plan that governs everything that happens in the universe and everything that happens in your life. Doesn't that give you confidence? To know there are no mistakes in God's plan? that your life is in his hands. And that's why no Christian needs to fear his departure from this world. As one person said, every person is immortal until his work on earth is done. We don't need to fear death. First of all, death is never premature, but there's a second reason not to fear death. And that is death is a necessary transition to heaven. It's a necessary transition from this world to the next world. Well, let me go back to my passport analogy for a moment. When my so-called friend finally gave me my passport, <laughs> and I presented it to that Soviet guard, I had to go through this little metal gate to go from one place to the next place. And as I went through that little metal gate, and it opened up at passport control, did I dread going through that gate? No, I almost ran through that gate. I was elated to be escaping the tyranny of the Soviet Union and head toward freedom. Well, you know, the Bible says death is like that gate. It's a little narrow passageway we must go from to leave the tyranny of this world and experience the freedom God has planned for us. Why would we fear going through that gate? It's what leads us to everything God has planned for us. The Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Paul was explaining why death is necessary for the Christian. One reason is we need a change of clothes in order to live and exist in the new world. I was reading what some futurist said a few weeks ago. He's predicting that in not that many years, many uh, citizens of Earth are going to be living on Mars. How does that strike you? Living on Mars. That's what they're predicting. That's what they say is going to happen. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but what I do know is this. If I'm going to live on Mars, the suit I'm wearing right here, right now, it's fine for Dallas, Texas. It's fine for planet Earth, but this suit isn't going to work on Mars. I'm going to put on a new suit, a space suit, in order to exist in that other world. And the same thing is true for us spiritually. This body that we're wearing right now, that we're clothed in, it's perfectly designed for this world. Paul says it's totally unsuitable for the next world. And that's why we have to have a change of clothes if we're going to go to heaven. And that's what death is. Death is a change of clothes. The word thanatos, death, means separation. At death, our spirits are separated from our human bodies. These bodies are left behind so that we can put on a new body that is designed for the new world. Why should we dread that? We ought to look forward to it. I mean, do you know any man who would mind exchanging his old ripped up pajamas for a new Brioni suit? Do you know any woman who would give up exchanging her bathrobe for a Chanel dress? What person in his right mind would fear that kind of exchange? Randy Alcorn, in his book on heaven, uses another analogy to explain why Christians don't need to fear death. It's not the analogy of clothes, it's the analogy of an unexpected party. Randy writes, suppose a friend invites you to a party where you know some people, but not many. The food is adequate, but nothing extraordinary. You enjoy meeting some new people and visiting with a few familiar people you know. Suddenly, your friend announces, 
it's time to leave. Although you're not quite ready to leave, you acquiesce because he's your ride home. When your friend drops you off at your house, you place your key in the lock and you turn the knob. Just as you open the door, the lights suddenly come on and everyone yells, surprise! Your family and your closest friends are there. They've brought gifts and have covered your table with your favorite delicacies. The first party was simply a ruse to get you out of the house so that the second party could be organized. Had you stayed at the first party, you would have missed the real party, the one at your home. Life on earth is like the first party. Pleasant enough, but at death you open the doors to your true home and discover that the real party is taking place there. Isn't that good? You know, I wish I could tell you as a pastor that every Christian I've talked to who faced death knew his or her death was imminent, that they faced their death with great courage and great anticipation and great joy. That wouldn't be honest. Not every Christian faces death that way. I've talked to Christians who are about to die who expressed regret. Regret over leaving the party too early, leaving family and friends behind. That's an honest emotion. But you know what? Any regret they may have felt here on earth is temporary and will be more than compensated when they start experiencing the hilarity of heaven. It's that hilarity of heaven that Jesus had in mind, I think, when he said in Luke 6, 21, blessed, literally happy, are those who weep now, for you shall laugh. That's why no Christian needs to fear death as he makes his way toward that place called heaven. Imagine the glorious laughter we'll enjoy together when we reconvene in heaven as brothers and sisters in Christ. I can hardly wait to hear your stories as you describe how God faithfully brought you into your eternal home with Him. To assure you that God's promise of heaven is the only way, I've prepared a resource just for you called What's 